You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. So we find ourselves um, in our series on waters, and today we're going to talk about um, one of the hard things in life that happens is uh, filling big shoes. Um, It's hard to quantify what leadership weighs, what it is, what it does, But um, it's not hard to quantify when you remember great leaders, right? I think of Winston Churchill in the height of the Battle of Britain when England, the the British Isles, were the last European power that hadn't folded to the Third Reich. They were under constant bombardment by the Luftwaffe. And um, Winston Churchill was in a cabinet meeting. And these were his words to his cabinet members. I find it quite exhilarating going at it alone. There's something to being shot at and it having no effect. How do you quantify someone who can say that? When the balance of Western civilization hung by that thread, aren't you glad there was a guy like Winston Churchill holding the helm? Like leadership. He had some moxie. He had some, some, something to him that allowed him to hold that rope allowed him to stay in it. And I love that about him. Yes, he probably drank too much, called people names, and smoked a lot of cigars. But in the end, he left big shoes to fill for the next person who would succeed him as prime minister. Do me a favor, tell me that guy's name, right? It's hard when you think about filling shoes. I remember as a little boy, Um, My older brother, Lincoln, was this mythical creature in my mind. He was so strong. He knew everything. He seemed um, independently fierce. He seemed driven and all these different things. We would fight, and I never got the best of him unless I was slightly deceitful, and I had my victories. But but he was just, he was legend in my mind. He he was one of the first people I ever remember having uh, the coolest haircut known to man. It was really nice, high and tight around the sides and up front. And in the back, there was a bit of a Mississippi mud flap that said there's still a party going on up here, a nice mullet. And uh, and he wore the best Canadian tuxedo ever, Levi's 501 jeans and a jean jacket. And I was like, man, I'd watch him walk away. I was like, who's the boss Lincoln is, right? I love my brother. He was just kind of mythical to me. And I remember like his Levi's leather jacket was so cool. He had it and it had that little Levi's tag and he took a 22 bullet. And he put it in there and I was like, it's the little things, Link. Like he was just great. I loved him so much. And I remember one day I, he left the house and I put on his jacket like, if only I could kind of be like Link, right? If I could be like Link. And turns out it was a little too small and I remained single for a number of years. But I tried. I tried to fill those shoes. I tried to be a little bit bigger. I, I did that a number of times in my life, going hunting with my dad. One time I put on his hunting boots. And by the end of the day, my feet had blisters the size of baseballs. And I was like, these things are tough. They didn't fit. It's hard to really understand what it is to feel inadequate when a leader is taken from you or when you try to be like someone. But the reality is in God's word, we see this theme emerge. And we as the people of God need to understand the centrality of God and the decentralized nature of our role. We may lead for a season, but we are not the be-all, end-all. He is. We're going to hear a story today out of 2 Kings chapter 2. It will show us what it is like for someone who's following, well, someone with really big shoes. There were two prophets at this time in Israel, Elijah and Elisha. Elisha was Elijah's protege. And the end of Elijah's life was coming, and he knew it. And this story unfolds out of 2 Kings chapter 2, and I want you to get in there with me. I want you to go to the place where maybe, um, maybe we leave this sanctuary and we imagine the dusty foothills of Judea and one man walking with another man and these last moments of an earthly journey together. And maybe we just go there for a minute and we feel the story and we can uh, kind of remember the connections we've had with people we've loved and lost. It goes like this. Now the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal to Bethel. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. 
Elisha looks to his leader and he says, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as you live, I will not leave your side. And so Elijah relents and they walk on. As they get towards Bethel, the company of prophets comes out from Bethel to see these two great men of God. And they come up, not to Elijah, but they come to Elisha and they say to him, do you know that today the, the Lord will take your master, Elijah, from you? He says, I do know about it. Be quiet. <laughs> I think that's awesome. He doesn't want to hear any of it. Elijah turns to Elisha and he says to him, the Lord's sending me on to Jericho. Stay here. Elisha responds, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as I live, I will not leave your side. So off the two men of God go, traveling on foot together. And the tension builds, both of them knowing that this earthly time is coming to an end. Elisha wondering how he'll live without his, his mentor, his friend, his leader. And Elijah probably enthralled with what God's doing right now. They get towards Jericho. The company of prophets come out again, a different company. And they go up to Elisha once again. And they say to him, do you not know that on this day, God will take from you your master? And he said, I know of it. Say nothing more of it. The company of prophets turns away from their city and they watch the men of God. As they get into the journey, Elijah turns again to Elisha and he says, the Lord has sent me across to the, to the Jordan, to the river. Stay here. Elisha in familiar refrain says, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as I live, I will not leave your side. So the man of God walks, the two men of God walk to the river. When they get to the river, we see Elijah do this thing where he takes off his outer cloak and he rolls it up and he swats the river, whop, and the river just goes woof and parts. And the two men walk across on dry ground. I always find it fascinating how they point out dry ground because at the bottom of, dry, of rivers that have been parted, it's usually very sticky, silty, clay-like mud. They walk on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah turns to Elisha and he says to him, what can I do for you? What can I do for you before I'm taken? Elisha, in a, in a moment of great bravery, he says to him, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elisha replies. And then we see this story begin to unfold. You have asked a great thing. It's a hard thing. Yet if you see me, if you watch me as I'm taken away from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not. As they were walking and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses on fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. At that point, Elisha saw this and he cried out, my father, my father. Like, think of the intimacy of that. Think of the tenderness of that. He's screaming out to someone who means more to him than the world. My father, my father. The chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and he tore his robe, which is a sign of grief in the ancient world. Elijah, Elisha then picks up Elijah's cloak that had fall him, fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Listen to the desperation. Listen to the anxiety. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah, and he did what his boss, his mentor, his friend, his leader had done. He struck the water with it. And then he screams out, Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. Notice what it doesn't say. I just wonder if his feet were muddy this time. I don't know why it doesn't point that, why it you know, goes to not say that, but I think it's important to note that he crossed the river, but it wasn't noted that it was dry ground. We have this, this reality we have to deal with of what it's like to be left behind. We live in a world where death is a certainty. Everybody in this room is terminal. It's just whether or not we believe it. And we are living a life that has a clock on it. 
And some of our great leaders will leave. And what we do when a leader leaves is really kind of interesting. I don't know about you, but I find it very scary when someone I look up to, someone I adore, someone who has set a pace for me and trained me up and loved on me, when they are taken and I find myself alone, maybe at the tip of the spear and I'm afraid. And I think it's important to note for the church, courage, my friends. This life was never promised to be easy. Elisha would have been terrified to do what Elijah had been. Imagine the the idea of following in those footsteps. It takes courage. The church cannot be weak and what handed sitting here going, oh, I don't know what to do. We know who we are. And we know that we must live courageously into his calling, even if it's beyond our ability, especially when it's beyond our ability. When we leave, when a leader leaves, it gets scary when we're left behind. Things can get a little dicey. You have opportunities that feel more like, well, cliffs you can fall off. And we look at this moment and we understand that the words of A.W. Tozer really fit well here. In his book, The Divine Conquest, he said this, nothing of God dies when a man or a woman of God dies. Let me say that again. Nothing of God dies when a man or a woman of God dies. The spirit of God is not quenched. A person is taken to glory and the spirit seeks for another willing, obedient, courageous soul in which to lead his people. Leaders come and go. The spirit, the son and the father God do not. They are permanent and from everlasting to everlasting. But it is scary. It does take courage for men and women of God to lead as we're called, but we are called to fill shoes that are bigger than us, to imagine that we could be more, not in our own power, but in the way that Jesus Christ explained to his disciples. Because here's the best part of it. The disciples were 11 terrified men. 11 terrified men. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, they sat around a table and Jesus was talking to them and we see Jesus make a promise to them and we need to understand what it's like. These are fishermen, tax collectors and people with bad reputations. They weren't well respected and well loved. They had been with Jesus and they had gotten some of his maybe attached to his fame, but they were not people in high standing. And when Jesus is talking about being taken from them, they had to be thinking, well, how do you fill those shoes? I mean, just imagine with me how horrible it would be if, um, if, if the physical person of the Lord Jesus was the pastor and he said, I'm going to a different church. Who'd be the pastor would be like, yeah, I'll follow that. But that's what the disciples had to do. They had to follow Jesus. They had to follow Jesus, but he wasn't going to abandon them when he left. There's a difference between an intentional leaving and abandonment. Here's what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 14, these disciples who will take it over. He says, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Here's where it echoes of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah had 16 miracles to his name. Do you know how many Elisha did? Please double 16 and shout it out. 32. Isn't that cool? He got a double portion. And Jesus is echoing this. He's interrupting the narrative. He's not saying, what do you want from me? He's saying, this is what I want for you. I want for you to believe in me so that you will do even greater things than I have done because because I am going to the Father. And that implies something. If Jesus is leaving and he's leaving the work to his church, Jesus is telling them that something will change. And we'll talk about that in a second. It goes on to say, I will do whatever you ask in my name. As a five-year-old, that was my dream sentence for my parents, right? I will do whatever you ask in my name. So many Christians have gotten this wrong. God, I feel called to a boat. <laughs> you know, you're like, no, mercy ships, you know, not the speedboat you wanted. But you, you and I get this confused at times where we're like, well, I want these things. But Jesus is saying, whatever, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. 
And he's implying that our hearts will somehow be different. Our desires will be manifestly changed from what they are right now. He's implying this. And he says, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The way God transforms the disciples to fill the shoes of the Lord Jesus Christ is giving them the Holy Spirit of Christ. This is where we begin to live into our narrative because how could anyone outdo the work of Jesus unless that's exactly what Jesus wanted, unless that's exactly what he desired, unless in, that, in some way that would glorify him if those who followed him would rise up, not in their own power, but invite the Holy Spirit to come and change their desires. Part of the problem with the American church, the West Mission, the Foundry Church, is we have so many desires that corrupt our God-given desires and his desire for this world, his love for this world. God loves this world. He hates the sin. He hates the brokenness. And who did he send but you and I? in this time and place to live into it. The same way he sent his disciples and he told them, ask me in my name because he knew on Pentecost he would send his spirit. And when the spirit of God fills a Christian, suddenly we see, discern, and experience what God does on behalf of the world. We begin to ask for his heart to come to pass. We begin to see things as he does and experience this world, not so much for its benefit to us, but because God is burdened for their souls. He loves them. Greater things, he said, you will do than I have done. It seems hard to believe until you look at the book of Acts. Think of what Jesus did. Let's just, let's just unpack one quick miracle. Somebody comes and asks Jesus to heal their daughter who's sick. Jesus takes off. As he's walking, a woman who's been bleeding for 12 years reaches out and grabs the hem of his robe, like the leg of his jeans. And he stops and he said, power left me, who touched me? And he was surrounded by people and his disciples were like, everybody is touching you? And he says, no, power left me. They find there's this woman on the ground She's been bleeding for 12 years. In the Hebrew legal system, it was a theocracy. If someone who was bleeding touched another person, that other person became unclean. And everybody was then touching Jesus, so the whole crowd would have been ceremonially unclean. Not allowed at the temple, right? But what happens? What's this great thing that happens? This woman was sick for 12 years. She touches Jesus. She's healed in an instant. And what should have made him unclean, he actually pivots. And that brokenness is healed and nobody's unclean because what was broken, Christ has mended. What was unclean, Christ has made clean. There's this thing where you're like, whoa, he healed her and he restored her. And in the same spirit, We are called to be agents of healing and restoration. And if you don't believe me, look at the everyday ordinary lives of people like Peter, of Paul. Remember how the lady reached out and touched the cloak that Jesus was wearing? You want to hear how it got even better in the first church? Paul would take a handkerchief and send it to the sick. And that, holding that, would heal the people that were ill. Paul wouldn't even physically be there. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems kind of crazy and awesome. You're like, wow, Jesus didn't even do that. That's kind of cool. I mean, well done, Paul. I mean, what do you do the first time you're like, take this, you know? That'd be a little nerve wracking, but it gets even better. In Acts chapter five, we see Peter and John, they're walking up to the Temple Mount. And I don't know about you, but I've grown increasingly disappointed with my shadow It's lumpy in places it used to not be. It was more svelte when I was younger. It seems like the sun's out of alignment. And and if you think about your shadow, it's nothing more than the absence of light. Besides Peter Pan, nobody's ever lost theirs, right? And, um, and, And your shadow is just where the sun hits you and outlines for you the places where you should probably work harder. It's, it's your shadow. It's a replication of you in darkness. And here's the cool thing. Peter walking to the Temple Mount, when his shadow, the unmeasurable, unquantifiable shadow of Peter would cross over people, they would be healed. 
Okay, you're good with it. I am too. I think it's great. Like, I want that doctor. Hang on a second. Woof. Oh, that's legit, right? Like, go to the dermatologist and everything's better. I would love that. You know, like, doc, I have a wicked head cold, circles under my eyes, super stuffy. They, like, hold their hand up to a lamp, and you're like, oh, my lamp's great. Do, think of, that's crazy, but it's real. Greater things you will do, Jesus said. But what had to happen? He had to leave and leave the work to those next. Who's next? We have to deal with this reality. We're in a great line, a chain of humanity, giving glory to God in the lives we lead, in the lives we live, giving glory to God in the shadows we cast, giving glory to God in the way things transpire in our lives, in learning the fact that no leader is unreplaceable. Make no mistake, this isn't my goodbye sermon to the foundry. I hope God keeps me until he just moves me across the street to the cemetery in Zealand where I live. That'd be my desire. But I don't know God's desire. I just know this, that if I walk out and get smoked by a Mack truck tomorrow, somebody else is up. You got to lead. If something happens, it's your turn. Well, actually, no. It's just your turn whether or not I leave. Courage, my friends. Courage, church. We have to remember that leaders always leave, but the spirit of God remains, seeking to inhabit those who will courageously obey God in his mission to this world. God understands that leaders are replaced because he replaces them often. It seems like once a generation. That was a joke. All right. Um, we, we look at this and realize like leaders come and go, but God doesn't. God stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. Heroes leave. Heroes leave. I mean, go look on my bookshelf. I remember the day when John Elway retired and I was like, don't go, buddy, I love you so much. I still love him super much, even though my son has turned on me and wears a Patriots jersey in church, which seems so wrong in church. But, um, but, but I look at it, he has his little hero. I have mine. I loved John Elway, but you know what? He just, what? He wasn't the future, I guess, anymore. Leaders come and go. Heroes leave. Don't have a hero in the faith. Have Jesus. Follow Jesus. Ask Jesus to send his Holy Spirit into you. Become someone's hero by getting into the shoes of the great cloud of witnesses, the Christians, the godly people who've gone before us and served and given their lives and mission to God. Quit thinking it's not up to you. You're called. I'm called. There is no excuse for the church to sit back. He will lead you through the waters that are terrifying because without our leaders, we wonder who we are. But without our leaders, we remember we always belong to him, amen? amen. We were always filled with his spirit, amen? amen? It was never them. It was always him. We have to live in that tension. Heroes leave. People change. I think that's one of the things I hate most in life. Sometimes good people change and become something we like less. People change. They move, they go, things happen in life that maybe we wish didn't and they diminish in our eyes. Nothing more painful than seeing a good leader become a very fallen leader. It hurts, but it happens. Don't follow people because heroes leave and people change. But here's the hope, church. God never does. God remains yesterday, today, and forever is God. His son is our savior. His spirit is our guide. His spirit is our power. We live not according to the vision of leaders. We live to the calling of Christ. How dare the church think it follows someone when they are call called to be in relationship with the one whom they are called to reflect. See, Elisha walked through the waters not because he was a protege, but because he did it in God's power. God takes us through the waters of life. No man, no cloak, no person, no woman. God leads us by his power. We have to learn to depend on him. We have to trust in him. They pass through the waters in his power, not their own. So we learn this one lesson that we are called to do as Jesus said. Ask me, ask me. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. I will do it. 
But the Christian doesn't ask the same questions as the rest of the world. The Christian asks the question, God, what breaks your heart for this world? God, how can you use my life to glorify you today? Ask him, ask him. Do you have a neighbor? Do you have a friend who doesn't know Christ and you don't know how to reach him? Ask him, he made him, he knows. He knows what'll get to him. He knows the chink in the armor. Do you have a coworker who's a blasphemous tyrant who hates you and is terrible? Ask God, he still died to save them and he will use you if you will just ask. If you begin to beat with his heart in this world instead of your own, If you ask, send your Holy Spirit every day, church, ask this. Send your spirit, God, fill me to the top that I can feel what you feel for this world, that I can be what you want me to be for this world, that I can adequately reflect the love of Christ to a world that seems to hate him. One of the most mind-boggling moments in my life was in science. It was back in the early, before they like had specific science says. It was like I was in science. And my teacher said, the moon has no light of its own. And I was like, (laughs) what? How can that be? It's a round and shiny. It's the moon. I couldn't get it. And she's like, well, it reflects the light of the sun. I was like, they let people like this teach? Who lies to children on a daily basis? I asked my dad about it. I couldn't figure out if it was glass or shiny. I mean, there's a reason I took first grade two times. But, um, <laughs> but I, I, I just remember thinking like, how can that be? It's made of earth, like just dirt. I don't know, space dirt, I guess. I don't know what it's really called. Clearly, <laughs> science is my thing. But, um, but it's just, I mean, it's just the moon. It's just the moon. Have you ever shined a flashlight on dirt? And they're like, ooh, look at its reflection. No. But somehow, when that full moon's out there and it's a clear night, you can see forever. It's beautiful, right? It has no light of its own. So you may be sitting there thinking, Eric, I was not given the gift of leadership. That's fine, reflect his. Eric, I wasn't given mercy. That's fine, reflect his. Eric, I don't like serving people. That's fine, reflect his. Whatever you lack, ask God and he will give it to you. We can never forget that this world is on a slow path to hell and he intends that we change the course. We can never forget that our calling is to get moon-faced in this life and reflect the love of Jesus over it so that no one crossing from this life to the next will ever say, I didn't know about this Jesus because all around them, the light of Christ shone in the faces in this room. Ask him, ask him. It's a really weird question. You probably won't forget it. It'd be fun to ask, God, make me moon-faced and hopefully not the wrong way where you're so big, but just really shot me. God, I want to be moon-faced. I want to reflect the love of Christ into this world because I've reflected my own passions, desires, and drive for long enough. I want to reflect something that is purposeful, eternal, and will change this world we're in. We have to be people who ask the question. When we ask Anything in his name, he will grant it. So ask him, fill me with your spirit and then start asking the questions that follow because I guarantee you this, it'll make you moon-faced to a world that doesn't know how loved they are. Our calling has always been courage through the waters, courage through the circumstances, trust in God beyond your circumstances, trust in what he's doing on behalf of those who don't yet know they have an advocate, they have a savior, they have a Lord who loves them. They will know once we get moon-faced. Lord Jesus Christ, we are your church. This is your city, this is your state, this is your country, and this is your world. So today we just ask, Would you make us ambassadors of your grace into it? Would you bring every person in our sphere of influence to a saving knowledge of you through the reflection of the love of Christ in our lives? Help us to lead. Oh God, courage for us, your church, who are honestly, it's just a little bit terrifying to allow the church to be more than Sunday mornings. God, help us to love this world the way you do by filling us with your spirit. We confess you are the God of this all. And we also confess that your best work isn't done yet 
that greater things remain to be done in our time, in our generation, in this moment, in this place. Come, Lord Jesus Christ, and be our leader. May we reflect you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, please stand. Sing this prayer with me. It's a great song of confession. Come on. So I'm going to give you a couple of practical things I want you to do this week. I want you to be people on mission. I want people to be like, there's something weird about, you know, about 1,200 people around town just acting fishy. I want that. I want you to start praying for every church in this community. Every person you see, when you're at the grocery store, pray for the person in front of you. When you drive by a church in town, go reform Pentecostal. Put a hand out below the window so no one sees you unless you're really into it. And then you go high and pray for them. Pray for their leadership. Pray that people would have soft hearts to receive the lost and the hurting. Pray for their pastors. Pray for everything you can and get God's heart on this thing. Get God's heart for this world. And then, man, it'll just happen. It'll happen. Because when we get his heart for this world, nothing can stop the church. Because a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors upended Rome. And if they can do it, so can we. There is nothing missing except for the church's courageous response to the Spirit's cry. Invite him to speak. Invite the Spirit to speak to you. And then courage, courage as you obey. You're gonna have your families around tables this week. Courage to bless the ones who just drive you insane. We don't have to name them, but we know who they are. <laughs> bless them. You are called to the same thing as the disciples. Ask in my name and I will give it to you. Greater things than even Jesus did, we will see in our midst. Courage for the task ahead. As you go about this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is time for some moon-faced people to get out of this building. You are dismissed. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.